I'm Walter Schwab, executive producer of Fuse Logic TV and the host of Gov2. Welcome to episode two. We've got another stacked show for you today, and some of you may be viewing our pre show as we get everything all uh, set up and worked on uh, to, for the show to roll out. Uh, today, we again are joined by uh, some great guests. We've got Alexander Howard out of Washington, D.C., he's the Gov2 correspondent for O'Reilly Media. And we're also joined out of uh, Ottawa, Mike Kuyoski, who is the Vice President of Strategic Marketing and Digital Engagement for the Center of Excellence for Public Sector Marketing. We're going to get into that title a little bit later in the show, but first I want to talk to you about civic participation. It's incredibly important that we as citizens ensure that we let our government agencies know that we want to be a part of the process. And what I want to do right now is just kind of give you an example, a couple of examples in fact, of civic participation where people around the world are helping their government agencies learn more about a given topic. And in this case, I want to take us to the Isle of Man. Today on Twitter, uh, this was uh, pushed out by a number of Gov2 uh, advocates on Twitter. Uh, but uh, the Isle of Man is addressing the Dutch elm disease through the help of their citizens. And uh, we've got uh, open, in fact, if you go to open, elm.org.im for Isle of Man and the website is up now you can have a look at it uh, this is a very cool initiative I love this kind of stuff because it turns basically everybody with a mobile device or an internet connection into part of a human sensor network that can identify basically issues on a uh, on a grander scale than say the government can deploy on its own so everybody with uh, all of their hands make light work and that's really cool that's the part of uh, this program that I really like now if you look at the website there it's uh, actually you know I like the website actually too it, 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 uh, it's sharp looking it's clean it's simple you can get started right away um, one of the things they've also done is developed an Apple uh, application for this so that people with smartphones in this case an iPhone uh, can download the app and I think it's also available for Android as well um, can download the app and take a look at it. Now, take a look at the, what uh, the app can do. So you're walking along the, you know, the, the, the boulevard there in the Isle of Man, and you see a, a tree that you think might be suspect, might actually have some Dutch elm disease, and you want to highlight it. You can do it through the app, upload it. It'll highlight on the map itself to let the, uh, the government agency know about the fact that uh, you found a tree that uh, is, might be in trouble. So this is a really cool example of using geo-targeting or geolocation, a human sensor network, uh, providing information as people go about their daily lives. And so it's quite convenient to help out as well, which is another big benefit to um, making these apps really simple, accessible, easy, working on public data. Very, very cool. Now, I also wanted to highlight the work being done by the organization or the, um, the web developer, app developer behind it. I had a chance to chat with Andrew Grieve. Um, Andrew's with Red Robot Studios who developed the, uh, the application and um, he directed us to their website there for more information. I like to highlight app developers when they build this kind of cool stuff because this is a demonstration about how private companies, organizations, and in this case around the world, private organizations can level, uh, leverage public data, build applications, to improve the quality of life for residents in their area. Now there's many examples of these kinds of apps, uh, C Click Fix, um, 311 apps uh, with the APIs out of San Francisco, the city of uh, San Francisco. Uh, there's all sorts of things, even in our hometown and area here in Edmonton, uh, we definitely, in fact us, we, we have a, uh, a transit application, which by the way, a uh, little bit of breaking news, we're selling, we've sold it, it's uh, gonna go to somebody else. We'll announce more formally about that later on. But using public data to develop applications on it to improve services is a very cool outcome of uh, you know, integrating Web 2.0 technology into government uh, structure. So very, very cool. I wanted to move on to another subject on the civic participation side of things where uh, there's many examples of how residents can actually impact the way a city or a municipal budget rolls out. 
Now this isn't a brand new concept. In fact, it was first done uh, as far as the internets let me know back in 1989 in Brazil. However, it has progressed dramatically and Evan's got a link to a website uh, that uh, shows some examples of this happening in the United States here recently. Uh, in fact, uh, out of Chicago, uh, there's a number of different, uh, different examples of where residents have uh, contributed to the way a budget gets determined, the way the money rolls out, your tax dollars, and how it gets spent. Now, here's the interesting part. I know that there, there is elected officials watching right now or folks that work within government, some of them are shaking in their space boots right now about this kind of concept. They just don't want citizens getting into their business as they might, they might consider it. However, it's Im absolutely imperative that we as citizens start to work together with our government agencies to start to change the flow of information, collaboration together, and, and start to have some direct input in some of these things as we move forward. And certainly a city budget affects us all. There's no doubt that um, many people would like to have input on how their tax dollars are being spent, what the priorities are for them. Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute that we just unleash the hounds and just let it roll out without any sort of parameter, structure, framework around it. That's not what I'm advocating at all. But I do suggest, though, that we need more citizens standing up, taking the lead and saying, look, we'd like to be able to do this. How can we do it? Let's put a framework in place. So, um, now that was at shareable.net, by the way, if you wanted to learn more about that particular link. And if you actually just search participatory uh, budget online, you're going to see all sorts of links. Uh, one other one that I, um, I didn't actually supply uh, Evan to bring up on the show, but that I want to make sure that you're aware of. If you go to participatorybudgeting.org, there's an excellent uh, website developed there for all sorts of examples of this kind of thing rolling out. It seems like a well-developed website. It's been up for quite a while now, I think the, since 2006. So there's a lot of uh, information there. It's a nonprofit organization that supports participatory budgeting in North America. So check them out. Learn more about how you in your city, your town, your village could maybe start to talk to elected officials and or uh, folks within administration as to how you might be able to start this sort of city budget work within your community and uh, collaborate on that basis. Okay, now that was, uh, that's, uh, we've got a stacked show, so I've got to really keep it moving along. Um, now let's, uh, let's just head on to, um, to the next part. One of the things that I like to do in every show is highlight some of the events that are going on that are Gov2 related and or uh, open government focused, and those two things are different. We'll get into that a little bit later. With Alex Howard, we brought that up in episode one about how those two things are different, and uh, I'm going to ask him about that, so uh, we'll get an answer from Alex in a bit. But there's a couple of uh, three events that I'd like to highlight for you right now. The first one is uh, the City of San Francisco is sponsoring CityCamp SF 2011. That's going to be happening on June 8th, so if you're going to be in the City of San Francisco region, on June 8th, you should definitely take in CityCamp. Uh, the city of San Francisco is stepping up. And of course, that city in general has been doing a lot of work with uh, open APIs for 311 apps. Uh, there's certainly a major advocate in, uh, with respect to open government and the things that they can do there. So it's uh, terrific that they're sponsoring that event. Uh, also, OpenGov West happens this weekend on May 13th and 14th in Portland, Oregon. If you've got a chance to head down to that fine city of Portland, Oregon, take in OpenGov West. I know that they'd be happy to have you. Tickets, I believe, are still available. Uh, also, um, a little bit on more on the local side here. Next Tuesday, I'm going to be presenting to a small group of residents from the Strathcona County area. Uh, Councilor Roxanne Carr actually approached me and said, look, we want to get more residents involved, certainly in her ward here in Strathcona County, but we want to get residents involved in general. How can we do that? What kind of information can we arm these residents with? So we've, I mean, there's so much to cover. How do you do that in 45 minutes? But we've narrowed it down. We're going to start talking about how citizens can get engaged immediately on platforms such as Twitter and others to start to communicate directly with the local government here. And I know that uh, I've been, uh, it's been confirmed with me that several of our council members will be in the audience and in attendance there 
as well as many different residents. I hope to have a packed house there at uh, County Hall and uh, we'll go over some really interesting things. So look for the hashtag on Twitter, pound SHPK. Um, that's for Sherwood Park and also Strathco. That's also for Strath short for Strathcona County. And by the way, the Strathcona County Twitter account is Strathco County. I guess Kona might have been, might have been already taken, I'm not sure. But the, uh, the county uh, Twitter account is Strathco County. Let them know that you might be tuning in or coming down to the event next Tuesday. Okay, lots on the go. Now it's time I'd like to introduce uh, one of our guests here today, a special guest uh, in from Ottawa. His name is Mike Kuyansky, and he is, as I said earlier, the Vice President of Strategic Marketing and Digital Engagement for the Center of Excellence for Public Sector Marketing. Mike, welcome to the show. Welcome to Gov2. Thanks for inviting me, Walter. You're welcome. How are you doing? Yeah, you'd probably like me to uh, definitely give you an explanation of why my title seems to be the longest title you've probably ever heard in your life. <laughs> Pretty Would close, you like that I have to admit. Yeah, why don't you give yeah. us uh, just a brief overview of your your uh, your role at the uh, the center and what the center is all about? Look, the center was founded in uh, in 2005 with one goal in mind. There, think of us as a consulting, training, and speaking organization, almost think tank-like, that focuses on essentially achieving this one goal of advancing the marketing discipline in the public sector. There's a tremendous gap, as you probably know, in uh, in government organizations and nonprofits uh, across Canada and various, not just Canada, obviously, we work uh, in different countries around the world, but there's a tremendous gap in the practice of actual strategic marketing. See, the word marketing is probably uh, the most misunderstood word out there. A lot of people associate it merely with putting out brochures, promotions, the marketing communications element. We focus on the whole strategy element, the whole citizen-centric element in terms of understanding your audience, segmenting audience, positioning your audiences, your services to specific demographics instead of this common word that's used throughout government, uh, which is essentially whenever we ask, oh, who's your target audience? Let's say Service Canada or Department of National Defense, there's this general favorite word um, or favorite phrase in response to that, which is the general population. Now, if you were to ask anybody in the private sector that is in marketing and ask them what their target audience is, and they said everybody, you'd think they're insane. But this is the kind of mindset that actually a lot of public servants tend to have because they see it, um, and it's obviously not their fault, they see it as... You know, them having to serve every single Canadian or constituent or citizen within their given organization, their, their given country, right? But the reality is you can be more efficient and effective in what you do. So our organization is there to help breed that efficiency and effectiveness using and borrowing these practices from the private sector of strategic thinking and applying them in a purely public sector context, right? So understanding the very real challenges that government faces oftentimes, especially here in Canada, um, at the federal level of things like official languages, um, privacy policies, the fact that uh, on a lot of these digital channels, um, I mean, let's face it, a lot of them come from the U.S., right? And so a lot of people aren't familiar with this, but there's a very real um, fear amongst plenty of public servants that their data is going to be accessed via the Patriot Act, et cetera, right? So a lot of times these kind of barriers are put up as walls and no progress is made uh, on various initiatives, right? Especially in terms of this whole two-way digital engagement side. Now, getting back to my specific title within that, um, so again, as I said, our organization focuses on the speaking, the training, the consulting. There's a tremendous con uh, educational piece within all this, but uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to keep it as something very short, as in you know VP Digital or this or that. Because look, uh, we need to understand our audience. Again, we have to practice what we preach. We're marketers. Uh, that apply it to the public sector. So our audience works in acronyms. Our audience works in comprehensive descriptions. It's very process focused, and uh, and it's a very simple reason. From a from a purely technical angle, when a request for a proposal comes out, oftentimes if somebody is looking for strategic expertise versus marketing expertise versus the digital, etc., those particular words need to be in the titles. Are you right, saying so that, are, actually, Mike? Are you saying that basically what you're doing is uh, you're you're responding to RFPs by by wowing them with the the right and the longest title possible? 
I, yeah, you know what? I bet you that actually works. I bet you it does. Yeah, uh, in reality, in my particular section inside of the business, the digital engagement side, I mean, we do very little of the actual of our RFP component. I mean, a yeah. lot of it right now, because it is so out there, it is kind of, uh, there are plenty of buzzwords surrounding social media. Sure. Everyone wants to get into this space. So a lot of it is, it is obviously by request basis or through speaking and training. Sure. But okay. if you look at the full center's name, right, the Center of Excellence for Public Sector Market, what does it sound like? Does it sound like a private sector web design company? It's not, yeah, right? no, it's I long, mean, clearly, clearly uh, you're in the, you're in the public get, sector for a reason there, Mike, right? So uh, what we'll do is uh, thank you for that and thank you for yeah. the explanation for the center. Um, I know that Evan's got the, uh, the website up. He's, had, he's been showing the website so that people can find out more information about your organization. Um, that's fantastic, and it's going to bode well. I've got some questions uh, uh, coming up for, for both of you. But before we go on to uh, the Digifile with Alex Howard, I want to take a quick break, and uh, we're going to come back. I wanna, we've got a regular segment here that we're forming out calling, What Does Gov 2.0 Mean to You?, uh, we're going to run a quick video here from the Sunlight Foundation. They've put out a, a short video here for about uh, 40 seconds or so. We're going to watch that. Then we're going to come back with Alex Howard and the Digifile. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Uh, I like that video. It's so simple. It's so short. I mean, I think it'd probably go on for minutes and minutes, but uh, I like how they kept it short and uh, illustrated still a point of collaboration and interaction. So that's very cool. Now I'd like to move on to the Digifile with Alex Howard. Alex has got a couple of different, now of course, you know, we call it the Digifile, Alex, because of course that's your Twitter account. Um, but uh, you've actually... Uh, you got a couple of items that you want to talk to, uh, about today. First of all, bright scope and open data, and that's on uh, radar.oreilly.com slash gov2. Evan's going to pull that up. Alex, tell us all about that. Okay, so again, it's a pleasure to, to join you here. And just in case anyone's confused, it's just Digifile with a PH on Twitter. There's no, there's no the in there. Um, <laughs> although, you know, as far as I know, I'm the one on there. Uh, it's a, a Twitter handle. That's all it is. Nothing more. Um, my, uh, my story this week was actually a follow-up on this uh, company called Brightscope. Um, Brightscope's a startup out of California. And they came to prominence a couple of years ago because they were able to get um, public data from the Department of Labor and uh, use it to compare 401k fees um, and show um, that there are you know, billions in excess fees that people didn't have to be paying. Uh, so essentially by getting that data and making it more usable over the course of years, they're actually able to, to build a business upon it. Now, what, what's interesting uh, this, uh, this time around is they've done something a little bit different. Um, same kind of theme, right? They're taking uh, public data. In this, this case, though, it's data from the SEC and FINRA. Um, which, of course, are financial regulatory bodies. And it's specifically about financial advisors. And they've now pulled together about 450,000 uh, records. They're working to gain more. And uh, they are posting them at brightscope.com and uh, providing really an unprecedented level of transparency into um, the financial advisor world. Um, and notably, they're doing it in such a way that makes uh, the data searchable, in a way that it's not currently uh, under government. Um, and right down to being indexed by Google. So I, I think this uh, certainly has the potential to uh, cause uh, structural change um, as long as the uh, SEC and, and Finner doesn't get so upset that they try to shut them down. Yeah, you know, what's, what I really love about this is, uh, first of all, this is a very tough sector to, to open up, right? It's so regulated. I mean, it's just incredibly regulated. So the fact that Brightscope has managed to provide this kind of platform of transparency is is very cool. You know, I always say, if, if, if organizations like this or this kind of industry sector can figure out a way to do something like this, then, you know, certainly more agencies within government, more levels of government can figure out as well. So that's a great, 
a, a great uh, idea here that uh, Brightscope's onto. So that's very cool. That's very cool. Now you were on to uh, uh, talking about uh, the UK's Alpha Gov site. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, sorry, I just uh, lost you for a second. A little echo, the wonders of skyping out uh, here. Yeah, um, you know, there's there's something interesting going on across the pond right now, um, uh, and it, it's really, I think, based upon this uh, uh, thinking that. Uh, when people go to government websites, they don't always find what they've come there to do. The, this is the whole idea of, of being citizen-centric in terms of your design. And this is something that the private sector has been working on now for, you know, for a couple of decades. We started seeing web pages going on in the, you know, up in the early 90s. And over time, uh, designers have worked together with people who do user experience, with everyone else who understands um, you know, that Often when you go to these destinations, it's, it's to do something functional. And so uh, the UK, uh, underneath uh, um, some pretty smart folks, uh, specifically uh, Martha Lane Fox, who has been one of their digital strategists, um, is, is um, reworking um, how it's approaching um, a, a kind of a universal website for, uh, for government. And we'll see what that actually means in practice, right? Um, right now, it is literally an alpha. Uh, if you go to um, alpha.gov.uk, you'll, you'll see this different site. It's very lightweight. It's uh, um, actually geolocated, so it should theoretically sense where you are. And it, they're trying to build it around the things that people go to websites to do, right? So they try to do some analysis of the reasons people show up places. And if, if this sounds familiar, again, it, it should if you're into web design, if you're you know, thinking about um, any kind of, of user design. And it's actually a very similar kind of process to what the Federal Communications Commission here in the United States did in its redesign of FCC.gov, which incidentally uh, officially went live today with a new version. Uh, they analyzed what people were coming there to do and then organized the navigation and the information architecture of the site around that. And uh, alpha.gov UK is um, really working towards that sort of thinking. Um, and uh, notably, it's built using some uh, open standards and technologies, which make it pretty cutting edge. Yeah, I mean, anytime, again, you know, the things that are going on over in the UK are, are really cool, very amazing. I love this kind of thing. And again, that open standards, integrating open standards wherever possible is something that, you know, I can get behind for sure. Um, you know, great. It, 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 you know, Evan was able to pull up the FCC site too as well, Alex. So it it's actually looks pretty cool. It's uh, pretty neat uh, all the way around. That's great. So, Mike, I want to go to you quickly. Mike, if there was a favorite sort of open standards, open government uh, project that, uh, that you're a big proponent of here in Canada, is there anything that comes right off the guy? I mean, there's some, you know. Yeah, the, the recent uh, data.gcca data portal, right? Launched yeah. by uh, Stockwell Day there before he left with, uh, with uh, David Eaves. And it's obviously been years and years uh in the actual making, and it finally came out. Yes, um, I, I believe last time I checked, there were only 700 or 800 or so data sets there. Um, yes, the obvious website look and feel could be uh, significantly improved. Um, but let's face it, in Canada, we've had uh, our own unique challenges, especially at the federal level, releasing any kind of open data and centralizing this process. But this is a tremendous start. And the reason why um, I like this portal so much is because, look, I, I do about uh, two or three different speaking engagements or, or training workshops throughout Canada uh, a, a week, right? And every time I am capturing kind of this whole broad social media space landscape and how it affects government organizations, and every time I talk about open data, eyes open up, right? Everybody, it, when it's positioned a particular way, people get it. The, the problem I'm kind of seeing, though, is that too often, the, the whole open data field, even by the names kind of associated with it, are very technologically sounding, very techy sounding, right? And so it alienates a lot of the audiences I deal with by having a direct impact in accelerating open data efforts. So a lot of the communications, uh, uh, strategic communications, marketing folks within government that could directly apply this sort of approach towards making whatever their service, et cetera, program they're trying to get out there, get more people using, they could be applying concepts of open data, but they have no idea about it. So right. going right. back to the portal, I'd love to see some kind of concerted strategic marketing effort of the actual open data portal and encouraging use throughout various organizations within government. 
Well, I think getting <laughs> building awareness is absolutely part of the part of the issue that still resides here. And actually, it's a great segue into uh, one of the, the the question of the week that we want to lead into. Mike, thanks for highlighting uh, data.gc.ca. Uh, you're right. First of all, on the design side, it's not overly inspiring, but it is very typical federal government designing. Well, common uh, look and feel too, all right? They have I, to abide by that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that is definitely uh, falling in line with, with what they're doing. So maybe they need to take a, uh, a bit of a lead from the, the UK Alpha site that we just reviewed in terms of uh, reviewing all of that uh, design uh, implementation or redesign implementation and using some open source there. But uh, moving on, the question of the week that I want to pose to both of you and give you a chance to answer to, uh, you know, on May 27th, uh, 2010, Business Week wrote... Uh, an article with respect to uh, Gov 2.0 being the next internet boom, okay? Now, we're almost a, a year later, and uh, I don't see that this actually has become yet matured enough to where we can call it an internet boom. Uh, my opinion is that we're not there yet. We haven't hit the critical mass. Uh, we're just now seeing things in this country, for example, in Canada, just, uh, you know, the, the, the data, open data portals and stuff just being releasing. And the fighting and the, 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 the working and the battling to get government to even consider that. Uh, and open data is, is got to, it has to happen before any of the private sector can start to actually work with any of this data that the three levels of government are sitting on. So my question then again to you guys is, has Government 2.0 at this point been an internet boom as Business Week was predicting over a year ago, or just almost a year ago. Mike, why don't you go first? Yeah, sure. Um, here's what I always tell people regarding that. Um, an internet boom, I'm, uh, I'm skeptical, right? Of course not. And why? Because, again, as a marketer, I'm always looking at our online audiences, even in terms of citizens, in terms of segments. At any given time, you have, let's say, 10 15% of uh, online users that are active, online content or critics and behind them you have just joiners spectators and then at the other end of the spectrum you're inactives it's never going to be everybody They're, not everybody is going to be engaged in open data and open government not everybody um is and that's just ties down to individual personalities that's just a simple fact now within that community of engaged users of active content creators that also happen to be active citizens Yes, there is tremendous uptake. There's still a lot of room for growth, as I mentioned. Not enough people, even content creators, et cetera, that could be leveraging this, that would be passionate about releasing data sets, having apps for uh, uh, <clears throat> or open data apps contests, et cetera. Not enough people know about that. I like agree. We have, sometimes we are just stuck in this bubble of, I mean, I go to plenty of open data events, et cetera, talking about all this progress, yet another city that released something yet. When I talk to the actual program people involved in these programs, very few know about what's, what it, what's actually going on. They think it's some kind of web techie initiative for apps developers or for programmers. It has very little to do with that, right? That's, That's great. Yeah. yeah, exactly, Mike. Uh, Alex, uh, what do you think? Are we still got a lot of cultural change to go before we can start to say that this is going to be the next Internet boom? Well, I think the frame's a little off. Uh, I'm not surprised in the sense that um, most people usually extrapolate from Web 2.0 to Gov 2.0, right? And that's not um, exactly a shocking thing, given how the various people using the terms or how they often think of it. Um, and, and I think that the, the maybe better way to think about it is um, how government can do things better, um, more, more intelligently, um, more efficiently, in a more lean way, all the different ways that I think government is going to need to work um, or uh, in order to respond to budget cuts to increased citizen demand for services, for information, for transparency, you name it. Um, you know, th there's uh, more going on here than uh, governments getting onto social media. And if you think about Gov2.0 in that sense, it's profoundly limiting. Um, and I think that there's a uh, important long-term way to think about this. Um, if you think it's going to ignite an internet boom in, in two years, um, I think you're setting yourself up for failure um, along the same lines that uh, when a politician runs on an issue and doesn't deliver on it in two years, you run into trouble. Um, you need to think about what happens when you change the way that information is released and when certain kinds of information is released, um, when certain kinds of standards get defined. 
We talked about this a little bit last time uh, with respect to the direct project and thinking through uh, standardized ways to transmit health information securely from point to point. Over time, that's a structural change, right? That And, and there are now um, dozens of companies that are building based upon that standard. Um, if you look at the release of health data, uh, once again, Todd Park over at HHS, the first CTO there, talked about releasing that and trying to become the NOAA of health data. Now, people don't think about there being a weather data boom, right? People might not, might not think about there being a GPS boom. But if you look at all the different services that have been architected and created on top of that as a result of government deciding to open that up, we're in a very different place. And I think the, um, the changes that we'll see in terms of booms aren't going to be ones that people immediately are going to recognize as resulting from open data. They're going to be when the data is baked into things, right? When the financial data is baked into Google, when you simply search for an advisor and now you pull up the record and, and see the indices, you won't think, well, oh, you know, Open government did that. You know, this Gov20 movement and all that techie stuff changed it. You'll just be able to go and do the thing you want to do. So, uh, you're, you're, Alex, I think, I think you're making an excellent point. I think that one of the things that I'd like to add to that is, um, you know, I think that uh, erring on the side of policy change has definitely got to be a component. There is definitely a cultural change that has to happen to make government more efficient. So we need to have policies that reflect efficiency in the way that you're speaking about. We need to have cultural change internally to reflect the same thing. But we also do have to have technology change. I mean, we do work with uh, different levels of government where when we do a show, something like this, for example, on behalf of a government agency, they're not actually able to even watch it themselves. They're not actually sure. able to watch the broadcast that they're paying us to do, right? right. And so, so I think it's a, it's a complete picture that we need to talk about. And I think I, I agree with both of you in the sense that uh, we're not yet there, um, and I think you're right, Alex. We can't set a like a two-year term or a you know any sort of timeline on it because there are different levels of government operating at different speeds different. and adopting and at different rates. rates. Um, mm -hmm. So um, thank you for those thank comments, you. guys. We actually do have a question from the the chat room right now. Evan's going to let us know what the question is. Yeah, Alex already answered it a little bit in the chat room, but uh, SM Caffrey asks, uh, he'd love to hear what the guest thinks next steps are for open data after apps, contests, and the initial engagements. Ah, question about sustainability. Fantastic question. So, uh, Mike, uh, just a brief, uh, brief, brief answer. Keep it, keep it short. Uh, what's your response to the question from the audience? Look, uh, as Alex just kind of pointed out, this stuff needs to, the key component here is integrating it into our workflows. So once all the kind of open apps contests disappear, this data is just going to be embedded into existing programs and services, right? So um, you, so it's, it's the next step is going to be logically taken as instead of just releasing some sort of mobile app by, let's say, uh, the Health Canada Pro Food and Product Safety warning group, right, or the health recall group, it's going to be literally tagged into all the barcodes of stores, et cetera, so that when you're checking it out as a consumer, that open data is built in there and it says that this product has been recalled, period, right? So that it, that transition process uh, happens naturally. Cool. Alex? Yeah, uh, we're starting to see, I think, some of the best practices that have... Um, evolved over the, I think, what, three years now since Apps for Democracy went live here in Washington. And you could even see the people who architected uh, those original contests shifting their thinking. And uh, it's, I think, instructive to look at how Apps contests are being run by those people in terms of the way that they're thinking about incentives and the way that they're thinking about uh, making it something which is going to be relevant to the, the needs that users have. I mean, there, there is utility to, suit, to serving up open data and then encouraging um, the developers to go look at it, right? They'll, they'll often help you clean it up. They'll often identify missing um, elements to it, whether it's incomplete data sets or incomplete metadata, um, other problems with the data quality itself. Um, but the, the larger, I think, sustainability of, of apps, contests, and open data in general is going to depend upon whether the data itself is high value enough for um, the different uses for which it's intended, right? And, and uh, you know, Vivek Kundra, the CIO of the United States, usually breaks those down into accountability, civic utility, and economic value creation, right? And, and, that, and honestly, the, the latter is the hard one. 
Um, people can't build businesses on this stuff unless they can trust its, its validity. And, and uh, you need to look at the trials and travails and the backstory of Brightscope to think about what it's taken for them to do that over the course of years and years. Pacific um, utility thing is a little bit different. Transit data is a really good story there. But it's also very complex in terms of the backstory of what it takes to get the data unlocked, all the policy that needs to happen, um, the technology infrastructure that needs to go into that, and then convincing people um, you know, why it's important to do it and what it actually brings to people. Uh, that is, the citizens that use the mass transit. Usually the citizens using the mass transit are acutely aware of, of how um, poor it is, and uh, the data may or may not give them better tools to navigate that. In order for there to be support for, I think, the transit agencies continuing to do it, though, the public has to support it, get used from it. Entrepreneurs need to have some incentive. And that goes back to um, thinking about how these uh, contests are, are architected. Uh, usually when people look at um, some of the new ones, that look, look at, say, Apps for Good is one that's running right now. Um, there's, uh, I think, Apps for Communities. It's something that the FCC's and Knight Foundation is trying to run. Um, and I look to uh, Clay Johnson, who's now at Expert Labs, uh, used to be at, at uh, the Sunlight Foundation, who's helping to run the latter. Um, and some of his posts on infovegan.com around the importance of community, um, which is very important in terms of thinking through how you actually involve people who you want to build this stuff, the designers, the developers, the citizens who are using it, the librarians who often know where all the stuff is, um, in the creation of these things so that when... Um, the contest is over, it doesn't just lie fallow and die, right. which is what a lot of these apps do. Yep. Right? They're actually continuing to get used. They get acquired by the, the government. They get acquired by private industry. There's an, there's an outlet for these entrepreneurs, civic entrepreneurs, in the same way there would be for creators of applications within incubators. Yeah. Because it's the same talent pool. That's if you right. don't give smart people incentives, they're not going to make the stuff. No, that's right. I mean, public sector needs to pay their bills every single day in order to exist, uh, or private sector does. Public sector doesn't always need to do that. They need to be accountable for the money they spend. But private sector definitely needs to generate revenue as a part of this. And so what I think will happen with this ecosystem, just in broad strokes, is, of course, just like the free market, it will thin the herd. Some will not be sustainable. Some applica uh, applications and app developers will just find this ecosystem not sustainable for them. Uh, depends on their, their point of attack on, the, on a given problem or solution. But I think you're right. There needs to. What's great about contests is, is it provides an opportunity for the, the, the public sector, uh, and in this case, most likely the IT branch of a given city or, or provincial or state le uh, level or federal level organization, to narrow the gap with the private sector app developers and give a reason to come together, start solving problems, and then the ones that really uh, are highly successful based on citizen engagement and uptake will survive hopefully down the road. And those who are maybe a little bit weaker on their platforms won't, but that's the nature of business in the first place. Mike, Alex, thank you so very much for being on the show today. We've run long again, but that's just because, man, there's so much to talk about. I want to thank uh, our guests uh, today, Mike Kioski and also Alex Howard. Thank you for tuning in via Skype today. We had a good, nice, clean show. Thank you to our online audience for tuning in for your questions and for paying attention. Please let everybody know about this show, Gov2, on Fuselogic TV. The reason why is because we'd like to cover the work and the innovation that you're doing in your government work every single day. And if you're a citizen, let us know what's important to you, and we'll look to highlight it on the show every Thursday at 1.30. Now, a quick programming note. Next week, I'm going to be presenting live down at uh, the, for the Society of Local Government Managers in Kananaskis, beautiful Kananaskis here in Alberta. And uh, I'm hoping to do a live Skype call and do the show live from down there, but we'll, we'll see what kind of technical uh, hiccups we may or may not have down there. But tune in nonetheless regularly on Thursdays, 1.30 Mountain Standard Time. I'm your host, Walter Schwab, and until next time, stay social. Thank you.